May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. So my husband thought that my sermon title this morning lacked ambition. Did you look at it? (laughs) Takes you a while to get things. It's Mother's Day, so I decided to go easy on myself in celebration. Everyone else is probably having brunch right now. You all may know this already, but Mother's Day is not just a Hallmark holiday. The first Mother's Day began in 1870 with the Mother's Day proclamation we read today by Julia Ward Howe, who is most famous actually for writing the song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic, during the Civil War after visiting a Union Army camp in 1861. You all know that song, right? Glory, glory, hallelujah. Yeah. Despite writing one of the most patriotic war hymns in American history, Julia Ward Howe is also known for her work for peace. In 1870, during the Franco-Prussian War, Howe began a one-woman peace crusade. She translated her proclamation into several languages and distributed it widely. In 1872, she went to London to promote an international women's peace congress, but was not able to pull it off. So back in Boston, she initiated a Mother's Day observance on the second Sunday in June and held the meeting for a number of years. Her idea spread, but was later replaced by the Mother's Day holiday that we now celebrate in May. So in honor of the original Mother's Day, I am preaching about war and peace, which is the Treasures of the Community auction sermon topic as well. The Treasures of the Community Auction is coming up next weekend. Are you all going? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. For those of you who have never been, you should know that every year for three years, I have auctioned off a sermon topic, and this year is no different. So bid high and bid early and often, and you too may get this great honor. So last year, Allison and Eric Darlington, who are sitting over there, bid hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions of dollars, I can't remember, (laughs) last year to hear me preach this very priceless sermon this morning. They are single-handedly financing our entire program for the church this year. (laughs) I'm sure. The Darlingtons, you may or may not know, are both veterans. And they both served in the military immediately before and following September 11, 2001. Is that right? And they served, though not in active combat, in the Iraq War. Their military experience led them to many religious questions. So they said to me, the Bible says a lot about peace and nonviolence. Jesus said to turn the other cheek and that those who live by the sword die by the sword. And Jesus said to love the stranger and the neighbor and the enemy. And and the, uh, the Ten Commandments says thou shalt not kill. It's one of the Ten Commandments as handed to Moses by God according to our sacred texts. So Eric asks me, what then does the church have to say to veterans who come home from war? Is there ever a time to kill? Or when it's okay to kill? What is the healing message that the Bible has for those of us who served our country in war? So thank you, Eric and Allie, for this very difficult and very important question. In so many ways, I am inadequate to the task of answering it. I myself have never served in the military, nor have I lived during a time of compulsory military service. Biblically, just like always, there are no easy answers to this question that you ask, but I do believe that the church needs to respond to this question. In fact, I believe a good response saves lives. In 2013, I gave birth to my first and only son, Isaac. And because you, Eric, asked me this question the other day, I watched Isaac 
tenderly put his baby doll, Megan, down to sleep in his crib, singing her a beautiful and tender lullaby. And the realization in that moment hit me like a ton of bricks that he would have to sign up for the draft when he turned 18. The idea that I may one day send my precious boy off to kill or be killed was like a knife to my heart. Just like you and Allie, we are teaching our children Christian nonviolence and love and kindness and hospitality and to pray for and even love their enemies. We hope that these are the core values who make up who they are. And one day, they may be asked to fight on behalf of their country. I don't believe my children will unlearn the values of charity, mercy, and patience, as Julia Ward Howe suggests in her Mother's Day proclamation. But they may instead feel as though they are forced to betray those values. I know this also because I am the daughter of a Vietnam veteran. And like many Vietnam vets, the war still haunts my dad. He was never comfortable marching in Veterans Day parades or being asked to stand and be thanked for his service. And he never told me much about the experience, but I believe going to Vietnam was one of the greatest regrets of his life. It is a quiet, omnipresent sadness that he carries around with him still. Regardless of one's religious or political stance on war, I think almost everyone who serves in combat agrees that it is hell on earth. It is common for the experience of war to shake one's religious faith. In 2004, Yale University studies of Vietnam veterans said that of almost 90% Christian, researchers found in that study that one third of the participants said that the experience of war had shaken their faith in God and that the church no longer provided comfort for them. Jesus told us that we are to bring food, bring comfort, bring a hand to hold, bring a bed for those who are homeless, bring water for those who thirst. And the church is no longer providing comfort to so many of its most vulnerable Christians. The spiritual crisis requires a religious response. It is our sacred task as the church to care for and to heal the spiritually wounded, and we are often inadequate to that task. If the Christian church acknowledges war at all, it is often with a shallow patriotism that glorifies it or a moralistic stance that unintentionally shames and further wounds those who have participated in it. And there must be a middle way that honors and heals. But first we need to understand the depth of the wounds. At the Ypres Learn that we had on race last year, I was in a small discussion group and one of you had a friend who served in Vietnam. He came across a member of the Viet Cong in his path as he was walking in the jungle and he had no choice. He had to kill or be killed. So he shot and killed the enemy combatant. He realized afterward that the soldier that he had killed was a 12-year-old boy. And so he came home haunted by that experience. He eventually committed suicide, unable to live with what he had done. It is estimated that 22 veterans commit suicide per day in this country, an alarming statistic. William Nash, a retired psychiatrist for the US Navy, says that it is not post-traumatic stress but moral injury that explains the increase in suicides. Moral injury, he says, is defined as damage to your deeply held beliefs about right and wrong. It might be caused by 
something that you do or something that you fail to do or by something that is done to you, but either way it breaks that sense of moral certainty. Nash says that he has heard it over and over again from Marines. The most common source of anguish for them was failing to protect their brothers. The significance of that is unfathomable, he says. It's comparable to the feelings I've heard from parents who have lost a child. Jesus calls us to care for the anguished and the lost, the wounded, those who need healing. The church's job is to preach about the redemption, love, and hope of a God who makes all things new. And so it is notable that though Jesus undoubtedly, Eric, preaches about peace and nonviolence, he does not judge soldiers unworthy of his care in the Bible. In fact, he honors them and heals them. In our gospel text today, Jesus heals the servant of the centurion at his request. This is the only time in the whole of the gospels when it says that Jesus is amazed by someone's faithfulness. This is significant, not just because Jesus is amazed by somebody's great faithfulness, but by who the centurion is. The centurion is a Roman soldier of the army occupying Israel. The army is the enemy of the Jews. And the centurion would have been raised pagan, so he is from a different religion. He may or may not even believe in the God of Israel Jesus teaches about. Jesus recognizes and is amazed by the special spiritual gifts that this soldier has. Because of his service in the military and his rank and authority within it, the centurion understands and respects hierarchy. He doesn't even come to Jesus directly because he feels he is unworthy to be under Jesus' roof. So he sends others in his stead to ask for healing of his servant from afar. His faith in Jesus' power is so strong that he believes Jesus can heal even from far away. And Jesus is astounded by both the soldier's humility and his desire to care for people far below the soldier's rank, to care for his servant. And so Jesus says, not even in Israel have I found such faith. He is amazed by his faithfulness. Soldiers have much to teach us about the practices of faithfulness. On Veterans Day week last year, I told you that we gathered for a forum that Paul Jones led with veterans of combat to talk about how we can care for their hearts and now that they are home. And I told you that there is something that one of our veterans, Gabe, said that will stick with me for the rest of my life. He served in 2005 and 2006. And he said to me, you have to understand that in combat we are trained to live together. We are all colors, we are guys and gals, we are gay, straight, all religions, all creeds. None of that matters. We sleep together, we wake up together, we eat together. And we are trained to save each other's lives. We are trained to know that we hold each other's lives in our hands. We have a sacred duty to keep one another alive. It's the only thing that matters, he said the thing we must know best how to do. And then we come home and we realize how much we missed while we were gone. How everything has advanced without us. Everyone has a small phone in their hand that we don't even know how to use. And everyone is in front of a screen all the time and they are staring at those screens instead of seeing us. 
instead of looking us in the eye. And so we go from being profoundly connected, our lives wrapped up in each other's lives, to profoundly disconnected to everything and everyone. In war, we are holding each other's lives in our hands. It is the most profoundly lonely feeling I have ever experienced to come home to a civilian world that is holding screens in theirs. Our veterans know about agape love, the love of Christ, which is not a feeling, but a sacred duty to keep one another alive, regardless of rank or status, regardless of culture or creed. Frederick Buechner says, wherever people love each other and are true to each other and take risks for each other, God is with them and for them, and they are doing God's will. Eric, I hope that this answers your question. I know it is inadequate. God is with us when we take risks for each other. God is there wherever people love each other and are true to each other. And there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So, I'd like to make a new Mother's Day proclamation for 2017 by Robin Wilson Bartlett. Arise, women and men of this day, all women and men who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears. Say firmly, we, were, we will neither glorify war nor, nor denigrate the service of the men and women who serve our country on our behalf. We will welcome them home. We will enfold them in our care. We will remind them about God who makes even horror into beauty even hell into heaven. We will honor what they have to teach us about love and what they have to teach us about human sacrifice and courage. We will make sure that they are never alone. Let us teach our sons and daughters charity, mercy, and patience, yes. Let us teach them that peace is possible and that their tender hearts are a sign of strength. Let us teach them love of country and love of this world. Let us teach them that right and wrong are not always absolute, that there will be times that their deeply held values will be transgressed many times over the course of their lives, and that we will be there to hold them in the love of God whenever this happens. Let us teach them about forgiveness and grace and redemption and resurrection rather than moral and ideological purity. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, justice is nothing to take for granted, so lay down your very lives for it. Seek peace, learn from those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, risk it all for love. Let people of all genders come together and share love of God. Let God be amazed by our faithfulness. Let us solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace, each worshiping God, not country. Let each person learn our sacred responsibility to keep one another alive to hold each other's lives in our hands. Let us fight against loneliness and fear as the greatest enemies to humankind. And let the church, who is the expression of Christ on earth, love and heal the warrior and all those who work for peace. Together, let us love the hell out of this world. Amen. There is more peace somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more peace.
peace. Somewhere there's more hope. There is more hope. Somewhere there is more hope. Somewhere I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more hope. Somewhere and one more time, love. Why don't we sing this for Sue? There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more. Love. Oh.